praise uh, the living God wherever that uh, you are tuned in and uh, welcome to this presentation and how we pray that uh, the Lord uh, will bless us and uh, we will continue to speak to our hearts as uh, we go through this uh, presentation. Otherwise, we thank the Lord for what he is doing for us. This is um, the series, The Prophets, and uh, how I pray that uh, the Lord will continue guiding us as we study together. This is uh, the number six in the presentation, how to use EG white materials, how to use EG white material. And uh, I'd like us to pray and then uh, see what uh, the Lord has for us. Shall we pray? Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for uh, this hour again that uh, we may be able to learn a few things. Uh, it's my prayer that uh, this series will be a blessing unto our soul and uh, help us to know how to continue using non-canonical uh, messengers that you have sent among us in Jesus' name. Amen. And so uh, in the previous uh, presentation, we were able to look at uh, how to interpret uh, E.G. White materials. And uh, in this presentation, I just want us to look at how we use uh, materials and uh, how we can get to a place that uh, uh, we shall not be um, trapped with uh, other people or uh, others who will not take uh, the pains of uh, studying uh, her materials. And so um, I won't uh, do the totality of uh, the material, but uh, what I'll do is this. I'll present what I can, and then I'll post a link to the full notes so that uh, we may be able to download them, that uh, we may be able to download them because uh, I believe we are living in a time where we have to understand well the materials of E.G. White and uh, how to use them. And so without uh, much I'd like to just share some few things concerning this. Uh, about uh, E.G. White and her materials, during her lifetime, Ellen White was a prolific author. Before her death, she wrote over 40 books, more than 5,000 articles and pamphlets. In addition to many thousands of unpublished letters, manuscripts, and diaries. As well as this, she frequently preached sermons at church services and at conferences, a good deal of which were transcribed and preserved. These documents typed by persons other than Ellen White are often treated no different to what she penned with her own hand. There is, however, a distinction between that which was written by Ellen White herself and the second-hand recorded transcriptions of her talks and sermons. Ellen White had literal assistants who transcribed her sermons and talks during deliveries. These transcribers are called stenographers. Stenographer is the art of shorthand for rapid and sunset note-taking. Shorthand was usually used to make a temporary record with a, a transcription or longhand copy to be made um, sooner. <clears throat> because of the inevi inevitable human error effect that results from a stenographer work, Ellen White will often make a handwritten notation on some manuscript to say that she had read and approved them or offered adjustment before they were published. That was how those stenographer reports were processed for publishing before her death. However, there's a uh, a lot of these stenographer reports that have remained as they were written by these stenographers, but there are no evidence that Ellen White ever read and approved them. 
these reports exist largely under the section summons and talks in the white estate. The presence of a signature, unless it can be proved to be an original handwritten signature, is not conclusive as her staff had a rubber stamp of a signature made for filed manuscript. Without an original hand signed copy, it is impossible to prove that she personally signed and approved of her transcript. Some of the transcript may have come into her archives after her death. The only certain way to authenticate that Ellen White signed off an account is if she made notations upon the transcripted manuscript or personally hand signed the document. Without this evidence, to authenticate this stenographic report, someone in talks, we can only have an idea of what she might have said. These reports need to be treated as an authentic and cannot be used to establish what Ellen White stood for or believed. And uh, may I just add, as we shall be going forward, that um, um, there are some things that uh, we shall be reading, um, which we can only ascertain what she said when we compare to other authenticated reports. So an example to show the unreliable, unreliableness to this uh, stenographer's report is the case of talk in the Battle Creek College Library uh, at 2.30 p.m. April 1, 1901. This single talk given by E.G. White has five manuscripts written by five different stenographers. At mid-afternoon on Monday, the 1st of April, the day before the 1901 general conference session began, Ellen White addressed many delegates in the library of the Battle Creek College. The content of this address is preserved in manuscript 43, 43A, 43B, 43C, and 43D of 1901. Being able uh, to compare these five manuscripts allows us to explore the room for variation in scenography and or the subsequent transcribing for a specific talk. What MS-43 records as new power the MS-43B, in agreement with the other manuscript, reads New Blood. Another example is where 43A manuscripts say he wants every living soul to deal with his machinery as God's machinery. And MS-43D says he wants every living um, a soul to deal with his machinery as good. That is, in brackets, God's machinery. At one point, manuscript 43 and 43b say gods want you to make straight paths for your feet, while uh, manuscript 43a and 43d says he wants you to make straight paths for your feet. Uh, and MS-43 says, I want you to make straight paths for your feet. You can see the variation. One last example, though this variation are numerous, is MS-43a and MS-43d. Uh, which says he wants the Holy Ghost to come in. And then in manuscript 43c, it says he wants the Holy Ghost King. And so by these examples, it's clear that stenographers were not 100% accurate and could not be trusted fully to have reported with, preci with precision what Ellen White had presented unless where Ellen White herself read and approved them. Our only safety, therefore, is to confirm these unauthenticated reports with the authentic writings. There is a principle that uh, Ellen White gives concerning her writing. And uh, here she says, and, you know, let me pause. Where, whenever you present this, whenever you present this, uh, there is uh, the conclusion of many that uh, you have started belittling the writings of E.G. White, or you, start cast, you have started casting a doubt on her writing. This is not um, the intent of the presentation. I want to give that disclaimer. This is not, you may conclude this is what I want to do, but this is not what I want to do. Um, I am a firm believer in her writing and uh, I quote her so much. And so this is not about actually wanting to belittle the gift or wanting to uh, uh, make none of effect of the uh, writings of E.G. White. And so this is what uh, she says. And now all who have a desire for truth 
I will say do not give credence to unauthenticated reports as to what Sister White has done or said or written. If you desire to know what the Lord has revealed through her, read her published works. Are there any points of interest concerning which she has not written? Do not eagerly catch up and report rumors as to what she said. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 696. Where there is uncertainty or question with a report of verbal presentation, the safest place to go based on Ellen White's principle above will be to her personally written works or writings she approved. Ellen White uh, writings may be categorized in two groups, authentic and unauthentic, and I'll go more on that and um, just expand on that. This is not a question of published and unpublished. Most of the difficulties that arises in the truth about the Godhead may be perfectly settled one, when one understands this basic principle of reading her writings. If it was published when she was alive, it is authentic, and if it could have its, her sign. If it was published after her death, we may trust it as far as her son was a trustee, and it had the rubber stamp, or there were the notations by her hand. If it was published posthumously, look at the source and know the context and the originality of the work. If the source is from her own pen, it is authentic. If the source is not what she penned herself, but a report, if there is evidence of her annotation, it is authentic. And uh, if the source is from her literal assistance and those sources are extant, extant as they were written, but there is no evidence of her interaction with the reports, it is not authentic. If it is what she wrote herself but unpublished, it is also authentic. So it is very wise to use authentic sources to establish what she meant whenever she came. You come to statements that seem to contradict the general tenor of her belief of certain topics. And uh, because uh, my labor is not to go through uh, the issue of uh, the truth about God, I'll um, just uh, want to do something different. I'd like just to go more on uh, sorry for uh, sorry for that. It's like uh, my camera is not firm, but um, I believe we shall be blessed. And so uh, there is a paper that uh, Brenda Nadison did on um, the, the framework of understanding E.G. White materials. That is what uh, I like to borrow from, a framework of understanding E.G. White materials. That is what um, I really want to look into a little bit before I go to talking about her uh, compilations. And so, what did Ellen White say? This is a, a work by, by Brendan Valiant, a framework for studying the words of Ellen White. And so, uh, in this paper, we look at the distinction between what was written by Ellen White herself and the second-hand recorded transcriptions. Five different manuscripts based upon a single sermon preached by Ellen White in 1901 will be examined and compared to evaluate the grounds for statistics of variance. Out of this consideration, a proposed framework will be set forth for studying these types of document within the greater corpus of Ellen White resources. Finally, the implications will be considered in regards to research on Ellen White's conceptualization of um, the heavenly trio. And uh, this paper goes into much of that, and uh, I'll be able uh, uh, to avail it so that uh, it, it, it's uh, something that is there uh, and it's not copyrighted. So uh, I'm using a fair use uh, uh, rule and principle where I quote him what he says and I mention his name, which uh, I think uh, was um, a good document. So he says, uh, Stenography is the art of shorthand for rapid and sanctity, not talking, taking. It is history dates back to ancient Greece, but it had been introduced into the American in the 16th century. 
During Ellen White's life, the major forms of shorthand was the Pitman and later the Greg systems. Both are still in use today. These systems are phonetic and allow writing speeds up to 350 and 208 words per minute, respectively. Shorthand was usually used to make a temporary record with a transcription or a longhand copy to be made soon after. Often, shorthand can run phonetic sounds of whole phrases together and this need to be sorted out in the transcription, while the symbols for the sounds can be very similar often with only the length or thickness of a mark making the difference between the letters. There are also symbols for popular words such as the, as, it, are, etc. In Greek shorthand, most symbols can stand for either a sound, letter, or common word, meaning that there is an added interpretational barrier when it comes to letter transcribing them. So it was the stenography and it is transcription into a format legible to the greater population was as much an art as it was a science. At first, the transcription was done into longhand. The first printers, which were economically practical, didn't come onto the market until 1874. Ellen White ever a technological progress, acquired several typewriters for her literal assistance in 1885 while they were still relatively new. These were then used for uh, transcribing her written, handwritten material as well as the shorthand notes of um, her sermon, shorthand notes for her sermon. And so she used this kind of um, making notes whenever she was actually speaking. Continued on. As with the rest of her ministry, Ellen White did not prepare notes in advance of her public addresses, but allowed the spirit to lead. The first sermon that was stenographically recorded appears as manuscript 8, 1874, though it is exact date is unknown some but not all of her uh sermons of of her sermons were subsequently prepared for publication the first published sermon appeared in the review and herald december 23 1885 in the 18 in, in the 1990s two volumes of previously unpublished manuscript called sermon and talks were produced by the white estate and even this didn't contain all that ellen white was recorded as preaching. Ellen White had many literal assistants during her lifetime. Many of these prepared her handwritten material for periodical and testimony publication, typed her handwritten notes for archiving for later use, collected materials for work such as the Life of Christ book, which became Desire of Ages. Some of these assistants were skilled stenographers. Below is a list of the people who assisted Ellen White with the years due White with the years during which they were associated together with her. Between uh, 1845 to 1881, we had James White. Between 1871 to 1874, we had Lucinda Hall. And then 1875, 1877 to 1878, there was Mary Clough. Arthur Grosvenor Daniels was uh, a stenographer in uh, 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 or one of those who assisted her in 1878, Mary Ann Davis, 1879 to 1904, W.C. White in 1881 to 1915, Sarah McEntefer, 1881, 1891 uh, to 1891, then 1895 to 1915. Then we have uh, Janice L. Ings, 1882 to 1888. Then we have Francis Bolton between the years 1887 to 1889, 1891 to 1894, 1894 to 1895, then 1895. Emily Clara Campbell, 1881 to 1895, and uh, Margie Bree, uh, between uh, 1895 to 1901, then 1910 to 1905, then Doris Eugene Robinson, 1898 to 1903, then to 19, uh, 1898, then 1903 to 1915, till her death. We had Nelly Helen Drulard, 1901, 1900 to 1901, and then Clarence Craig Chrysler, 1901 to 1915. So we have Doris Eugene Robinson and uh, Clarence Craig Chrysler working with her until her death. And so 
where multiple sets of years are recorded against someone's name, there was a break in their employment with Ellen White. Those that are known to have had stenography experience are Mary Ann Davis, Sarah McEnfenter, Mac Sarah Mac McEntefa, Sarah E. Peck, D. E. Robinson, and C. C. Chrysler, though others may have also performed such a task or worked in transcribing stenographic recordings. It is unknown whether any shorthand notes are preserved by White Estate. So, um, in a, a talk in the Battle Creek College Library at 2.30 April 1, 1901, and uh, I just went through it on, in a brief, but uh, I like to re include it here, is that um, uh, uh, we are told with some background in place, we can now look to add our source material for this study. We, with the release of the manuscript and letters in 2015 came an expected and unique opportunity. Among the more than 8,000 documents that were made digitally available were five manuscript recordings of a single talk given by E.G. White. Now, at mid-afternoon on Monday, the 1st of April, the day before the 1901 general conference session began, Ellen White addressed many delegates in the library of the Battle Creek College. The content of this address is preserved in manuscript 43, 43A, 43B, 43C, and 43D of uh, 1901. Being able to compare these five manuscripts allows us to explore the room for variation in stenography and or the subsequent transcribing for a specific um, talk. Manuscript 43 and 43b show an extraordinary deal of similarities to one another and different in many of the same ways from the other three manuscripts. The stenographers behind these two manuscripts is unknown, but they both appear to have had later editorial work, possibly from corrections given by E.G. White. The word count for MS 43 is for, for um, the word count for MS 43 is 4,905 words, while MS 43B has only 38 additional words for a count of 4,943. MS 3B simply states it was prepared by Miss White Secretary. MS 43 does not give any information on who, on who prepared it. At this time, Ellen White had at least four literal assistants in addition to Willie White. Known to have traveled with Ellen White to the General Conference was Sarah McEntefer and Maggie Hay uh, and her son Willie. If these two manuscripts were based on two individual stenographic reports, there were at least two people who could have recorded this among Ellen White's staff. The differences these two manuscripts sustain to the other three are one. MS 43 and 43B lack the introduction that is found in the other three manuscripts. MS 43 and 43B both clean up a lot of the free form expression that are inherent in an unscripted speech. MS 43 and 43B remove a lot of superfluous materials such as repetition of thoughts and expression. Manuscript 43 and 43B truncate some of Ellen White's narrative accounts, for example, of her journey from Australia to America and then to the conference. And then MS 43 and 43B clear up some ambiguities present in the other three manuscript. These are the sorts of changes that one would expect to be made during editing. However, there is also material in this manuscript that agrees with individual variants throughout the other three. This tells us that these were edited from at least one other stenographic report rather than one of the other three. The similarities between the two might indicate that one of the manuscript is derived from the other. If this is the case, MS-43 will make more sense as refinement of 43B. However, the similarities could also indicate that they were derived from two separate stenographic reports by people who used similar principles, as would be the case if two people worked in the employment of the same person. They could then have been corrected according to one another. And uh, I think this is the issue of those who are qualified in stenographic work rather than those who are not qualified. Most of the variants between MS-43 and MS-43B are incidental, such as the presence of words in one which do not appear in the other and which do not impact the meaning or synonyms, um, like uh, 
brightens versus alarms and purged versus taken away. In the cases of these synonyms, MS43B agrees with the other manuscript and MS43 holds a unique reading, most involved a symbol switching of the replacement of words or phrases. Only one significant difference exists where MS43 reads new power and MS43B in agreement with other manuscript reads new blood. Statistically, these two manuscripts hold approximately 96% agreement. That is uh, manuscript 43 and manuscript 43b. Um, though then, though when word switching is taken into account, this increases to around 98% agreement. Now, the other three manuscripts are notably longer than MS43 and MS43B, which tend to agree a lot, 96 to 98%. Manuscript 43A was based on a stenographic report by C.C. Chrysler. At the time, Chrysler worked for the General Conference. Soon af after this lesson, Chrysler entered the employment of Ellen White and went to uh, become one of the trustees named in her will. Chrysler's report clocks in at uh, 8,106 words. Chrysler's report appears to be the most formal. Now, there was also another unknown general conference staff member taking a stenographic report. This is preserved as MS43D. This report contains 8,127 words. The final account of Ellen White's speech, MS43C, comes from J.H. Kellogg, about whom a significant portion of the talk was concerned. Kellogg's count contains the most unique variant out of any of the manuscript. It appears closer to the two general, uh, general conference prepared recordings and contain 7,586 7, words, sorry. So these three manuscripts all preserve a rougher form of English that will be expected in direct speech as opposed to the edited version in MS-43 and MS-43B. Like the reports from Ellen White staff, the two general conference reports contain a remarkable correlation. It might appear that there are two versions of a similar report, apart from the fact that there are obvious signs of their being used to correct one another. One example of this is where Chrysler Manuscript says he wants every living soul to deal with his machinery as God's machinery, and MS43D says he wants every living soul to deal with his machinery with his machinery as good, God's machinery, in brackets. This demonstrates that there are two unique reports and that MS3, MS43A was being used to amend MS43D. In this instance, Chrysler agreed with Kellogg's report, while manuscript 43 and 43B did not preserve this portion of the talk. Though the majority of agreement is between MS43A and uh, MS43D, each of these occasionally agree with Kellogg against each other. Usually it is an attributed account which will agree with Kellogg against Chrysler's. While MS43C has the most unique variant, they all have occasion where they hold idiosyncrasies. And uh, just something, the majority of uh, variation have to do with pronouns and the person of speech. For example, at one point, manuscript 43 and 43b say, God's wants, God wants you to make straight paths for your feet. Manuscript 43a and 43d say, he wants you to make straight paths for your feet. And uh, uh, this is a personal pronoun used here instead of uh, the name of God uh, uh, or the appellation of God. So um, appellation of the father, which is God. I think uh, we have here personal pronoun he. He wants to make you to make straight paths for your feet. And MS43C says, I want you to make the straight path for your feet as if it was E.G. White who was telling uh, the person. And uh, as we have seen that uh, most of this had to do with uh, J.H. Uh, uh, Kellogg. And so it seems that E.G. White was telling J.H log that I want you to make straight paths for your feet instead of how it will be understood God is telling Kellogg that he wants him to make straight path for his feet 
in one place, MS43A and MS43D says he wants the Holy Ghost to come in, while Kellogg manuscript says uh, he wants the Holy Ghost King. Now, you have also to understand one thing that was going on 1901, 1902 to 1907, uh, uh, controversies. While Kellogg was uh, uh, doing his work of uh, um, writing the, the book, uh, The Living Temple, you, you can see how his mind is reasoning. Um, and uh, he says, Kellogg reports, he wants the Holy Ghost King because Kellogg had come to believe that uh, the Holy Ghost was another God uh, uh, whatsoever. But uh, when you look at the other writers, they say he wants the Holy Ghost to come in. And so that variation, it, it may seem nothing to someone who doesn't understand the crisis at that time. But uh, with a keen eye with the crisis which was happening at that time, you can understand why Kelo could report he wants the Holy Ghost to come to, uh, uh, he wants the Holy Ghost King. But then I just like to say this. I want I don't want to judge Kellogg because I was not there and I don't know his motive. These are human thoughts and uh, may God forgive me if I have misrepresented what was his thoughts. But then uh, as human beings, we tend to relate what somebody is writing with their system of belief. And so I'll just like to leave it at that point and say that uh, whatever was going on in his mind and the crisis that was going on and E.G. White addressing him in that conference, uh, it talks too much. It has um, too much to ponder about. Now, Brendan continues to say, remember, I'm still reading from the paper of Brendan. Don't think that these are my notes. Uh, I just found them to be so good in uh, dealing with the framework and the context of E.G. White materials and what uh, she said and what she did not say. And so what I'm reading is somebody's material, which I find that um, it, it is helpful to me. If it is not helpful to you, uh, I, I just apologize for that, but um, I found this to be helpful to me and I, I thought that I could share. So this is Brendan Nadison paper. When I come at the end of it, I'll just tell you I have come to an end of it and enter maybe in some my, some of my notes a little bit. These discrepancies could be caused by two possibilities. They could demonstrate variations in what people heard Ellen White say, just like different witnesses pick up different things, or they could reflect errors in the shorthand or in the transcription. For example, come in and king are phonetically similar. In a, a shorthand system that left out vowels, they may have been difficult to distinguish between. Furthermore, some of the variants could reflect difficulties in designing between shorthand letters which look similar. And um, just uh, carrying that point a little bit further is that um, look at the synoptic gospels and uh, the variations that are there. I think uh, it is between uh, Matthew and Luke. One says that um, after six days and another one says uh, after about eight days. Luke being a historian accounts um, uh, uh, does um, inclusive reckoning of, of the Jewish people and um, th there's that variation that you find and it's interesting that even in uh, the gospel synoptic gospel accounts there are variations and uh, this variation actually does not disqualify any of the writers of the gospel and so we cannot at this point disqualify the stenographers of the work of E.G. White uh, unless behind them they had a motive and unless they reported something so different from the system of the system system belief of uh, EG White, that is when uh, we can dismiss them. Uh, but I'll continue. I know there's a lot uh, that people talk about these materials. So statistically, the two general conference manuscript of the talk agree with one another 97 percent of the time. and when one order changes are taken into account, this increases to almost 99 percent. Kellogg's account agrees with with each of these manuscript about 92 percent. And so um, we can try to cast doubt on him, 
because he had come into another system of belief. But uh, according to the statistics that I have done, he agreed 92% with other writers, uh, scenographers. The difference between the shorter edited versions and the three verbatim account is of a much greater magnitude and is difficult to quantify. They agree less than 40% of the time in wording, but when substitution of words and word order are taken into account, it increases to around 54%, which is impressive considering the small accounts have only around 60% of the word count of the larger recordings. So reflections and obs observations. The value of this manuscript whole the value of this manuscript whole is that they demonstrate that stenographic recording suffers from the same human error that law enforcement officers encounter when they are examining witnesses to an incident. Our manuscript witnesses reflect, reflect um, different versions of the same event which were recorded in real time. We can look through manuscript 43A, 43C, and 43D. Remember 43, 43 plain and 43b almost agree in everything so we can look through manuscript 43a 43c and 43d and be confident that uh, what ellen white said at this time was similar to each of them where they differ it can be difficult to know which witness to choose a synthesis or critical edition of eg white's speech might also be worth the uh worth the exercise but it will still not provide us with her exact words with perfect certainty the best we can conclude is that E.G. White said something like what is reflected in this document. And this is when she didn't sign them or if there were no notations of her own handwritten work. Another observation we can draw from this manuscript is that unscripted oration is less precise than personal writings. Even as I have written this article, that is Brendan himself, I have frequently deleted words and replaced them or had time to pause and grapple for the perfect expression to convey my thoughts. During a real-time presentation, a speaker has to rely more on a stream of consciousness where thoughts are repeated, broken off to try again, and mistakes are made. For example, Ellen White misattributed a verse from the book of Revelation to Daniel before being corrected by her friend S.N. Haskell. An honest mistake and certainly not a sign that she was not inspired. It should be noted that in some manuscript, Mark is recorded in the second and third verses of his gospel to be quoting from Isaiah when the quote is from both Isaiah and Malachi. And then uh, you remember a place where, is it Matthew who says that uh, actually this was written by Jeremiah when actually it was written by Zechariah. This does not prove that they were not uh, inspired. These are common mistakes which men can do. Extending on from here comes another consideration. I have preached many sermons in my time and some of these have been digitally recorded. When I have had the opportunity to listen back over those sermons, I have always been able to understand what I was talking about, even if I have had to cringe at the words I have used. That is, I know the meaning and intent behind my words, but that does not mean that this meaning and intent will be obvious to every listener. This is the fundamental problem we encounter every day with human language. The quest to understand and be understood. Never is this more apparent than in close relationship like marriage where careless words with good intent can be interpreted the opposite of what they mean to the speaker. So the two apparently edited manuscripts are helpful in clearing up some ambiguity. And they could also be considered to reflect a degree of involvement by E.G. White. When looking at transcripts of sermons, it will be important to see whether the copies manifest the free-flowing nature of a verbatim report or whether they may have been subsequent editorial work. Of course, even this is not certainty. A more reliable evidence that exists in some circumstances is where Ellen White made handwritten notations on some manuscript to say that she had read and approved them or offered adjustments. The presence of a signature, unless it can be proved to be an original handwritten signature, is not conclusive as her staff had a rubber stamp of her signature made for filed manuscript. Without an original hand signed copy, it is impossible to prove that she personally cited and approved of her transcript. Some of the transcript may have come into her archives after her death, as could have happened with the general conference and fellow copies uh, we have examined. 
an intuitive and integrated framework for interpreting Ellen White's meaning. Uh, as we continue looking at uh, this issue. He continues to say, with the observation, we can see that there are certain question marks which exist in the case of these ethnographic recordings that are not inherent in Ellen White's personal written material. A principle for dealing with this actually comes to us through something she wrote. And um, this is what she said. And to all who have a desire for truth, I will say, do not give confidence to an authenticated report as to what Sister White had done, has, say, had, has done or said or written. If you desire to know what the Lord has revealed through her, read her published works. Are there any points of interest concerning which she has not written? Do not eagerly catch up and report rumors as to what she says. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5. Uh, and so, regarding Ellen White's unpublished writing, she wrote uh, in 1905, I am looking for my diaries and copies of letters written for several years back, commencing before I went to Europe, before you were born. I have the most precious matter to reproduce and place before the people in testimony form. While I am unable to do this, the people must have these things to revive past history, that they may see that there is one straight chain of truth without one heretical sentence in, one, in that which I have written. This I am instructed is to be a living letter to all in regard to my faith letter. 329 A 1905. Apart from though volumes of testimonies and other pamphlets, the majority of Ellen White's published writings were compilations of letters, manuscripts, and diary materials which Ellen White wrote as God moved upon her. This material all began as unpublished matter and was compiled and edited under her close scrutiny. She once wrote concerning her close watch care of the process. I read over all that is copied to see that everything is as it should be. I read all the book manuscript before it is sent to the printer. So you can see that my time must be fully occupied. Besides writing, I am called upon to speak to the different churches and to attend important meetings. I could not do this work unless the Lord helped me. Letter 133, 1902. So we can have confidence that nothing which was published during her lifetime did not carry her seal of approval. We could also add to this book Prophets and Kings, which was begun in her uh, lifetime, but completed and published posthumously under the vigilant eye of Willie Clarence White. The same cannot be said of anything published after this book. We can now separate extant, extant literal compositions of Ellen White, including transcriptions of talks and interviews, into distinct categories under a hierarchy which takes into account both the level of involvement of Ellen White and others and proof authentication. And this is what I really wanted to show us, that um, authenticated first handwritings, these are personal written materials, e.g. letters, manuscripts, and diaries. Authentic first handwritings with secondhand editorial assistance there we have the articles and books pre-1917. This is how we can authenticate her materials. And uh, you have the first one, that is personal written materials, letters, manuscript and diaries, authenticated first-hand writings with second-hand editorials, articles and books, then authenticated second-hand accounts of Ellen White's spoken words, someone's interviews with personal notations. And then we have an approved compilation of first-hand writings. And this is what we shall see when we are ending this, what do we call posthumous compilations? What does she have to say about that? So these are unproved compilations of first-hand writings. And then uh, unauthenticated scenographic recordings, someone's interviews without personal notations. Now, we shall be talking about posthumous compilations and approved compilations of first hand writings. They are first hand writings, but then they have been compiled and then the headings have been added and they don't have con uh, context of what she is speaking about. And that is why they are called unapproved. They are unapproved because she, she was not the one who put there those headings. She was not the one 
who picked out of context those materials. Unauthenticated stenographic recordings, like um, some of the materials that come out, and they seem like um, she has used some words that uh, really doesn't agree with uh, her other work. Like uh, you have quotations like, uh, 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 when the saints reach in heaven, they shall fall uh, before uh, God and worship the Father, worship the Son, and worship the Holy Spirit. Whether somebody missed something there or didn't miss something there, it's, it's not something that we can start arguing about so much. But then we can look at her greater work. The Father and the Son are only to be exalted and other numerous places. Because this is only one statement where she says that we shall bow down and worship the Holy Spirit. But in other of her written materials, she talks about the Father and the Son being worshipped, the Father and the Son being on the throne, and then um, we should honor the Son as we honor the Father. And then this tallies with the, 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 the totality of what the Bible reveals, and it uh, agrees with other of her materials. And uh, because the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, it agrees with other prophets did. No prophet ever bowed down to uh, the Holy Spirit, but uh, they always bow down to the Father and they bow down to the Son. And then even in the book of Hebrews, the Father says when he brings uh, um, uh, the Son, when the Son is begotten, um, that uh, he tells the angels to worship him, worship him. But there is no account we have ha ever had of worship the Holy Spirit this was the only first statement that was made by her, and it's the only statement. And so we have to look at these things closely. And remember I said I'm not uh, casting a doubt on her materials, but just to help us to try and understand some things uh, in, their, uh, uh, in their truest sense. And so you can uh, screenshot this. You, you will find this in the notes. And so there's no problem. I'll be posting the notes uh, in the comment section both on Facebook and on YouTube, so that uh, you may at your own pace and time go through the whole material, my notes and uh, what uh, Brendan had. And so this infographic offers the first attempt to classify Ellen White materials according to the above criteria. The implications are extremely significant in terms of establishing Ellen White's meaning in places which may be unclear or ambiguous. If something is unclear or questionable at a lower level of authenticity and personal involvement, effort should be made to ascertain Ellen White's understanding at a higher level. And when we talk about the lower level, we are talking about um, unapproved compilations of first-hand writings and unauthenticated stenographic recordings. This is the lowest level. The higher level is authentic first-hand writings, then authentic first-hand writings with second-hand uh, editorial assistant, and then um, we can still look at authenticated secondhand accounts of uh, Ellen White's materials uh, or spoken words which have personal notations. This is the highest account. Uh, we have the highest account, the one following and the other and all in that um, uh, category. Especially, is this important where in the lowest levels? Posthumous compilations often piece together or chop up her words in ways which do not reflect the original context. Headings are also used that appear as part of the normal text, but which she did not have the ability to review, even if they might accurately summarize the content which follows. As such, there is the possibility that such an editorial work may obscure her meaning rather than magnify it. And uh, just to say this in a passing, you look at the book Evangelism and what has been done to it. This is uh, authenticated uh, uh, E.G. White material. But then uh, what we find there, headings have been put there, things have been put out of context, and there's a lot of chopping and piecing together. And understanding the, the background of Leroy Froome with the, the writing of the book, The Coming of the Comforter, and uh, all his stuff about... Uh, uh, what is this um, questions on doctrine and such a things? We we find that uh, really uh, it will be good to look at the context of the issues rather than just take what is in evangelism. A very good book for those uh, who uh, who want to know more about how to do evangelism. But when you come to the sections of uh, uh, the truth about God, very very many things have been 
are actually chopped up from their context uh, with a design that the author wanted to bring out a message which um, he himself believed rather than what E.G. White or the, the original author believed. And so, as we have seen the five variation of the Battle Creek uh, College Library talk, there is no direct certainty that a stenographic report accurately replicates a verbatim speech in the same way as modern digital recording. And uh, when we talk about modern digital recordings, uh, it's like what I'm doing right now. This is digital recording. Actually, you cannot say that somebody else reported. It is me speaking and the phone is speaking what I'm recording, uh, I'm speaking. And uh, there is a live transmission of what I'm speaking. So this is not a report per se. This is a direct uh, 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 information being given to you, both uh, in audio and in visual. And even if my words do not come out clearly, those who have, uh, those who can lip read, can lip read and know what I'm saying. And th or those who are familiar with my speech or uh, the things I read, they can accurately lip read what I'm saying and write down exactly what uh, I'm saying. And so uh we cannot, in stenographic report, we cannot say that everything was accurate or uh, replicates a verbatim speech in the same way as modern digital recording. There is also the consideration of that free flowing verbal communication is less precise than personal written material. For this reason, it will be negligence to use material which originates as stenographic recordings as a basis of understanding Ellen White's doctrinal views on any issue. This affects both levels of transcribed material as they do not necessarily reflect the preciseness of the writings. Reports of sermons and interviews which lack any personal notation or editing that can be proven to have come at Ellen White's behest or at the lowest tier of the hierarchy and should be treated with caution. We can know in such account that Ellen White probably said something to the effect of what is written therein, but it cannot be ascend, ascertained with the uh, hundred uh, percent accuracy. And so, even though this framework is most helpful at the lowest three tires, there is still some useful distinction that can be made between the first and second tires. Ellen White rarely sat down to write a book directly. With a few possible exceptions, all of her published content was derived from letters and manuscripts which were edited by her family and staff. While Ellen White signed off on every publication in her lifetime and left instruction for prophets and things which was begun in her lifetime, it is still helpful to understand these published works in light of the manuscript source material where the material is um, available. Now, Implications, just pass over this. Ellen White's doctrine, Ellen White's doctrine of God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit is extremely nuanced, and there are quite a few interpretations of her position on various topics. It is not the purpose of this discussion to sort that out, but simply to look at a few representative statements and how this classification system applies to them. So the first thing of the note of note is that several of the frequent used expression in establishing the general accepted view of the heavenly trio have been derived from someone materials. One particular statement comes from MS 95-1906. This is the report of a someone preached in Oakland, California on 20th of October 1906. This is the only manuscript where Ellen White uses the expression three beings. Now she writes, here is where the work of Holy Ghost comes in after your baptism. You are baptized in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You are raised up out of the water to live henceforth in newness of life, to live a new life. You are born of God and you stand under the sanction and the power of the three holiest beings in heaven who are able to keep you from falling. You are to reveal that you are dead to sin. Your life is hid with Christ in God, hidden with Christ in God, wonderful transformation. This is a most precious promise. When I feel oppressed and hardly know how to relate myself to uh, the work that uh, God has given me to do, I just call upon the three great worthies and say, uh, you know, 
I cannot do this in my own strength. You must work in me and by me and through me, sanctifying my tongue, sanctifying my spirit, sanctifying my words, and bring me into a position where my spirit shall be susceptible to the movings of the Holy Spirit of God upon my mind and character. This is manuscript 95, 1906. Uh, Tim Pryor has least scanned copies of the relevant pages of this manuscript from Ellen White's 1905-1906 letter book, Ellen White's Trinitarian Statements, What Did She Actually Write, page 23-25. This contain no notations or any other evidence that Ellen White interacted with this transcript. The format of the document is more like free form speech, including notations where other people spoke and a description of a testimony time period, as well as Ellen White's closing prayer. Based on our framework, we can conclude that Ellen White said something like what is in this document, but we will need to establish her meaning from other statements. Her more frequent and personal written expression, three persons, and whatever that means to her will illuminate whatever she was saying in this uh, instant. Another statement comes from a sermon during her time in Australia. And she says in manuscript 66, 1899, The Lord says this because he knows it is for our good. He will build a wall around us to keep us from transgression, so that his blessing and love may be bestowed on us in rich measure. This is the reason we have established a school here. The Lord instructed us that this was the place in which we would should locate. And we have had every reason to think that we are in the right place. We have been brought together as school, as a school. And we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds, unseen by human eyes, that the Lord God is our keeper and helper. He hears every word we utter and knows every thought of the mind. Now, this statement is from someone at the Avondale Church, March 25, 1899. It has been used to establish the personhood of the Holy Spirit since Leroy Edwin Froome composed a compilation to support the Trinity in the compilation Evangelism in 1946. Like the previous manuscript, this document shows an unedited free forms English that reflects natural speech. Without scanned evidence of this manuscript, it is impossible to know what interaction Ellen uh, Whitehead with it. Either way, more precise discussion of the Holy Spirit, the personality thereof and relationship to God is necessary to shed further light upon this expression. And so uh, outside of this are many other statement, statements taken from someone and talks which deserve to be in scrutinized more carefully in light of her handwritten and published materials. To demonstrate a distinction between these two categories, one example can be, represent, can be presented. The first of the statements below is from Desire of Ages, while the second statement belongs to a source manuscript for this section of the book. Now, in Desire of Ages, she says, page 669, the Holy Spirit is Christ representative, by the, but divested of the personality of humanity and the independent thereof. Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was for their interest that he should go to the Father and send the Spirit to be his successor on earth. No one will then have an advantage because of his location or his personal contact with Christ. By the Spirit, the Savior will be accessible to all. In this sense, he will be nearer to them than if he had not ascended on high. Now, in letter 119-1895, she says, Cumbered with the humanity, Christ could not be in every place personal. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them, go to his Father, and send the Holy Spirit to be his success on earth. The Holy Spirit is himself. Now you see that variation. While she says in Desire of Ages, the Holy Spirit is Christ's representative, she says in letter 119, 1895, the Holy Spirit is himself. That is Jesus Christ divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. Uh, the traditional rationale is to understand Ellen's white words in the letter according to her, the letter publication in Desire of Ages. However, according to the framework we have established from principles she herself espoused, this is the reverse order. Desire of Ages will have been edited for public consumption. If there is any ambiguity, we should look for our original um, manuscript statement to discover her meaning. So instead of, um, uh, 
instead of uh, looking in the letter material, which is desire of ages, we should look in the back. So uh, wh why do we insist on this point? In the previous series, we saw that the prophets grow in their understanding. But where they do not grow and say some things, we have to look at the previous. And so instead of the later statements actually shedding more light on the previous statements, we take the previous statements to uh, uh, remove the ambiguity of the later statement. This is uh, basically what uh, actually we are talking about here. And so because the statement of desire of ages Desire of ages seems ambiguous. The Holy Spirit is Christ's representative. To it seems like um, you can say that um, the ambassador of America to Kenya, something of that sort. And so, you know, America and the ambassador are two different things, and uh, it can cause uh, uh, something like a misunderstanding of uh, this person and America itself. And so. Uh, we, we look at the previous understanding of her material, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is himself. And talking about the Holy Spirit is himself, you have just to look uh, in, uh, sec this is um, 2 Corinthians 3.18, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, verse 18, Second Corinthians 3, 18, and this is uh, what we read, uh, 317, now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, look at this statement keenly, and I posted this uh, uh, yesterday. Now the Lord is that spirit. The Lord, this Lord is Jesus Christ. This, that spirit is um, a specific spirit. The comforter that was really promised. Now the Lord Jesus Christ is that spirit that was promised. And where the spirit of the Lord is. So that comforter and where it is. There is liberty. And this is what I say that uh, this is the very best way to talk about the spirit of the Lord being omnipresent. Now the Lord is that spirit. The Lord and then that spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so that spirit is himself divested of the personal, the, the person uh, divested of humanity. The Lord God, or that is Jesus Christ, the Lord God, is in heaven. Literally, he is in heaven, but he is present here, represented by his own spirit. The Lord is that spirit, the comforter that was uh, really uh, uh, promised. Now, so in order to, dis to, to, to understand desire of ages, and to remove the ambiguity, they could have referred to letter 119 and see what this representative is and who it is representing. And so from these examples, it can be seen that there is room for revaluation of our understanding of Ellen White's position on some of these more nuanced doctrinal positions. The purpose in this section has not been to provide a definite answer, but to raise questions which need to be answered and which can now be properly processed according to a logical and objective uh, framework. Now, just to go to the last segment of this presentation, um, how to use EG white material. Uh, I, I like to go to combinations. What do we have to talk about combinations? Uh, we have seen the authentic reports where we have the letters with uh, her handwriting. Then we have seen authenticated where there is editorial with her, her notations. And then we are looking at posthumous materials. This is the section I want to enter in and then uh, we finish up the posthumous materials, the compilation of her books. What does she have to say about this? In fact, 
Uh, before I go to that, I'll just like to pass through this uh, to show you something very important here that um, I am skipping. I'm skipping over Brendan material and going to my notes. Uh, this the appendix in the in the work of uh, Brendan, the comparisons of MS43, MS43A, MS43B, MS43C, MS43D of 1901. And this is what I'm skipping. The different stenographers, the five different stenographers that um, were in that hall to uh, report what E.G. White said, we have in MS-43 stenographer unknown, MS-43A stenographer was C.C. Chrysler, and MS-43B, we have uh, Ellen White secretary. That is what is just put there. Then we have uh, MS-43C, we have J.H. Kellogg. Then we have MS-43D, uh, that is general conference stenographer. Now, it is interesting, when you look at this, in the MS-43, you have almost a blank, then only one statement here. And then in MS-43, MS-43A, you have a full column of the writing. And then by C.C. Chrysler, and then in MS-43B, Ellen White Secretary, you have a blank. And then J.H. Kellogg, you have a blank also. And then the general conference, a stenographer, you have a full column. And so, I, I found this so interesting that um, they will have to skip over in some places. There was a lot of skipping over in some places and then just writing a statement, one sentence, one sentence. But uh, that one, you can check it in the comment that I'll be able to provide. And so those are the notes. But I want to go to this last section, compilation of E.G. White material. I'm just done with the Brendan material. So... There is another fact when talking about compiling of her material, and this was written to uh, the testimonies gabbled by Ellie Curtis, who was um, compiling her materials and sending out, and it seemed like uh, he was uh, uh, presenting the material as if it was direct from E.G. White, and it was out of uh, context. She said, and uh, it is interesting, there is another fact that should be stated here. I am not responsible for all that has been printed as coming from me. About the time that my earliest visions were first published, several articles did appear purporting to have been written by me and to relate what the Lord had shown me, but sanctioning doctrines which I did not believe. These were published in a paper edited by Mr. Curtis. Of the name of the paper, I am not certain. In the years of care and labor that have passed since then, some of these lessons, some of these less important particulars have been forgotten, but the main points are still distinct in my mind. This is in 1SM, page 60, paragraph 4, going onward. This man took articles that came from my pen and wholly transformed and distorted them, picked out a sentence here and there without giving the connection, and then after inserting his own words, he attached my name to them as if they came direct from me. Now, pause for a minute there. This is what Eli Curtis did. And this is almost what we do today. And if E.G. White was among us, she would say, I'm not the author of that material, even though most of these things were the quotations from her, but added headings and added some things that uh, were not of E.G. White. You could say the same thing of evangelism. They are authenticated materials of E.G. White. But then what brings in a problem is the headings that if she were alive, she would say, no, 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 no. Because there are things which are written there as headings. She never wrote them in her published works. Continued on with the work that Eli Curtis was doing. On seeing this Articles, we wrote to him expressing our surprise and disa disapprobation and forbidding him thus to misconstrue my testimonies. He answered that he should publish what he pleased, that he knew the visions ought to say what he had published, and, if, and that if I had written them as the Lord gave them to me, 
they will have said these things. He asserted that if the visions have been given for the benefit of the church, he had a right to use them as he pleased. Now, this controversy of early Curtis is not something uh, that just went by smoothly. But later on also, we find that uh, Kellogg uh, said that his writings had uh, a stamp of Ijiwat writing. And then Ijiwat said that uh, because of that statement, she has to come out and say, God forbid that such a thing will be. Because um, Kellogg was saying exactly what Ijiwat was saying. But then the meaning behind the words was so different. The meaning behind the word, the words were so different because the logical conclusion was his new belief, while actually uh, E.G. White herself had not changed the belief. By the way, if E.G. White had changed her belief, then he, she could have never had a problem with uh, Caleb. If E.G. White had turned into a Trinitarian, and here was Caleb taking her materials and promoting Trinity, then why would E.G. White come out and say meet it when actually what she was saying is what uh, Kellogg was saying? It doesn't make sense at all that somebody will take a material of somebody, espouse a doctrine, and then the somebody says, God forbid that this material should be said that they agree with my material. Think about that for a minute be, because that is a very important issue. Continuing with the early Curtis, she says, some of these sheets may still be in existence and may be brought forward as coming from me, but I am not responsible for them. The articles given in early writing did pass under my eye, and as the edition of experience and views published in 1845, 51 was the earliest which we possessed, and as we had no knowledge of anything additional in papers or pamphlets earlier of earlier date, I am not responsible for the omissions which are said to exist. Talking about the publishing of her compilation, she says, I can see plainly that should everyone who thinks he is qualified to write books follow his imagination and have his productions published, insisting that they be recommended by our publishing houses, there will be plenty of tear sown broadcast in our world. Many from among our own people are writing to me asking with honest determination the privilege of using my writings to give force to certain subjects which they wish to present to the people in such a way as to leave an impression ad upon them. It is true that there is a reason why some of these matters should be presented, but I will not venture to give my approval in using the testimonies in this way or to sanction the placing of matter which is good in itself in the way which they propose. The persons who make these propositions for aught I know may be able to conduct the enterprise of which they write in a wise manner. But nevertheless, I dare not give the least license for using my writings in the manner which they propose. In taking account of such an enterprise, there are many things that must come into consideration. For in using the testimonies to bolster up some subject which may impress the mind of the author, the extracts may give a different impression than that which they should were they read in their original connection. This, the writings and sending out of the testimonies to the church, page 25 and 26 are uh, quoted in uh, 1SM 58.3. About private compilations, <clears throat> she says, there are some who upon accepting erroneous theories try to establish them by collecting from my writing statements of truth which they use separated from their proper connection and perverted by association with error. Thus, seeds of heresy springing up and growing rapidly into strong plants are surrounded by many precious plants of truth. And in this way, a mighty effort is made to vindicate the genuineness of the superior plants. Letter 136, 19, 06, page 3 and 4 to Brethren Butler, Daniels, and Iwin. Uh, April 27, 1906, also repeated in uh, 5MR 154.1. Now, she continues to say in MS 188, 1907, they come to me, those that are copying my, my, my writings and say, now here is the better revised words, and I think I'll put that in. Don't you change one word, not a word. The revised edition would not need at all. 
we have got the word that Christ has spoken himself and given us. And don't you in my writings change a word for any revised edition. There will be revised editions, plenty of them, just before the cloth of this earth history. Now, brethren, pause for a minute. He says there will be many translations, many editions of her work just prior to the close of time. And so when we see these things happening, we should understand that we are not in the beginning of the time, but we are in the end of the time. And we should be careful with what we are reading because most of the way the writings are used are to make of an effect those writings. To keep pick, keep, pick, pick up the work of somebody and then switch the context or lift it up from the context and give it a whole new context, it is doing of none effect of the material of the original author. And this is how we misuse her writings. So because we are looking, how do we use her writings? Give the context of what she's saying, quote her the way she has said it, and leave it at that matter. Um, inform the people. This is where I'm taking the material from originally. Go and read it, but do not add things to her writings which she did not speak. And if you want to really present her well, it won't be picking here things and picking here things. Just go with the flow of her thoughts and then uh, it will be better than uh, misrepresenting what uh, she was saying. And so there will be revised editions, plenty of them just before the close of this earth history. And I want all my works to be understood. And I want all my workers to understand, and I have got a quite a number of them. I want them to understand that they are never to take the revised word and put it in the place of the plain symbol words just as they are. They think they are improving them, but how do they know but that they may switch off an idea, off on an idea and give it less important than Christ means them to have. And uh, here, E.G. White is not saying that it is the words which are inspired. It is the author who is inspired and puts down the words as the spirit of God leads him. Now, this is not to say that you the, 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 the words are inspired. This is a whole different thing. And I'll be coming to that verbal inspiration verse, thought inspiration in Adventism and uh, in non-canonical and canonical authors. I'll be able to deal with that in, the, in this series of uh, the prophets. And now to all who have a desire for truth, I will say do not give credence to unauthenticated reports as to what Sister White has done or said or written. If you desire to know what the Lord has revealed through her, read her published works. Are there any points of interest concerning which she has not written? Do not eagerly catch up and report rumors as to what she has said. And so um, what can I say in this uh, a uh, 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 presentation on E.G. White, how to use E.G. White's material fairly. It will be ever not, it will be good not to means in your own words. It will not be good to interpret what she's saying. Leave her writing the way they are without interpreting. Already they are in, a, in an interpretation, by the way. And so there is no need of interpreting what she said. The Bible will interpret itself. E.G. White has to interpret herself. It's not our work. It's not your work to interpret E.G. White. The Bible will interpret itself. The Bible can defend itself. E.G. White can defend herself. Whenever you don't understand her, her later materials, go back to her previous materials. Whenever you don't understand her previous material, go uh, forward and see what she wrote and see how she grew in her understanding of the subject. And then let us be careful that we be able to quote authenticated materials. Let us be able to follow up in the higher rank of what she wrote rather than take combinations and argue with unauthenticated reports which have no, uh, which doesn't have her notations and all that stuff. Does it mean that uh, she was not a prophet? Uh, with other things we have been finding out that she wrote? No, her, uh, her particular statements can be reconciled with her larger work. 
we can reconcile them. And what we can reconcile, leave it alone. It's not our work to reconcile everything. Even in the Bible, we are told we shall not understand everything. And so with that thought that we cannot interpret all her, of her writings and not understand everything in the Bible, I'd like to read a closing verse in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, it is interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And when uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is ending, it says, 12.31, but covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So Paul, who was one of the greatest prophets and evangelists and apostles, says that covet these gifts, covet even the gift of prophecy, covet even the interpretation of it, but I'll show you what is the best. And this is what we should be coveting at such a time as this. Whenever we don't understand the Bible, whenever we don't understand the E.G. White materials, we should not be striving and quarreling amongst each other. We should strive for the best of those, of those gifts. And what will be the best of those gifts? Paul goes ahead and tells us which is the best. That although I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or tingling symbol. And then when he is ending this, he says, and now abided faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of this is charity. We should covet love. It is because love is missing amongst us that we continue arguing about these things. We continue arguing about the Bible and we continue arguing about E.G. White materials. But look at the verse which I want is um, uh, this. Uh, verse uh, 3, verse chapter 13, verse 8 to verse 12. This is our closing remarks. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Whether it be the gift of prophesying, whether it be the interpretation therein, the Bible clearly says that we do it in part. And so this struggle of uh, seeing that we answer every critic and we understand everything will never help us in anything because the Bible has declared we only do that in part. And she says in other places, whenever we come upon a certain subject where we have to respond, let us do it briefly and go to the greater work of making sure that we bring souls into salvation. Because there are many things we are really struggling to understand which preoccupy our time and then we don't venture into the Great Commission as we should. If the efforts devoted in uh, Christian apologetics, and I'm not saying they are bad, right now I'm doing an apologetic, I'm not saying they are bad, but the time we consume in doing this at the expense of uh, going to win souls door to door, evangelism, supplying the literature to people, brothers and sisters, it is something that we should revise. And so uh, continuing with that thought is that um, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is not, which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And there's a lot of childish things which are going on amongst us, which when they are compared, when people say they are adults and they continue in child, childish things, you really just wonder. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. These things we understand in parts, these things are not conclusive in themselves. They are means to the end, but they are not the end of means. And so we should be looking at the greater and larger picture. Also, uh, in the issue, uh, we find that uh, that which we do not understand, shortly we shall be able to understand. Just briefly on this, uh, Uh, lastly, this is, we are told, when God is seen as he is, the blessed truth shines with a new and clearer light. 
that which kept the mind in perplexity is cleared away by the bright beams of the sun of righteousness. And yet there are many things we shall not comprehend, but we have the blessed assurance that what we know not now, we shall know here after. And uh, may the Lord bless us with these thoughts that um, what we do not know now, what we don't understand now, let us not kick at each other. We shall understand at God's time. Otherwise, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you and may we keep the major things major and minor things minor. Otherwise, we want the Holy Spirit, we want the presence of the Lord to guide us in this end time and how I pray that it will be the prayer of everyone. Shall we pray? Shall we pray? Our dear Father, thank you. Although the session has been long, but uh, we just thank you that uh, you are in the business of saving us, Lord. And we can understand more and more of this and grow closer to thee in our everyday life. And Father, my prayer is that that which I do not understand, the Lord, I may not grapple upon it, but that which is revealed unto us, it is for us and our children, and it's enough for our salvation. Bless your church, bless your people, and help us to come into the unit of faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so until the next time, the next presentation, may the Lord bless us and keep us. Those around Africa, good night. And those in other areas, good day. And uh, may God be with you all. Bye for now.